Welcome, everybody. My name is Dominique Jolie. I'm the chair of the School of Business and Technology at Webster University, Geneva. But I'm also the uh, director for research, research activities. Research means many things, but it also includes what we call the brown bag, brown bag seminar. And the brown bag seminar is exactly what is taking place uh, now. Uh, so I would like to, I'm going to be I'm not going to be very long for this introduction, but I would like to say a few words about the speaker today. So, uh, Caroline Hunt is one of our faculty members, and I'm very happy that she's here today. One, one reason for being very happy to welcome Caroline is because I know that she is an expert. She is very well recognized in this field of uh, whistleblowing. She has written extensively. She is especially working on a, on a project now of a book on this topic. She has done a lot of research published in, in top journals. So I'm very happy to be able to, to listen to her testimonial today about her research. So Caroline, thank you very much for being here. My recommendation would be uh, to, to talk during, let's say, 30 minutes. So, uh, we can have a question uh, after those 30 minutes. We will have to stop exactly at two o'clock because uh, we have other meetings which are starting at two. Uh, so let's try, let's try to, to stick to this schedule. Um, last thing, um, I, I, I understand that some people- What time are you doing this time? I don't... Maybe some people are not comfortable um, asking questions. Do not hesitate to use the chat. Yeah, there, is a, there is a device, there is a functionality, which is chat, so do not hesitate to use this. But there's no on here. So what's this? But he could do this before call. Okay. Can, can, you please, can you please put your mic off? Okay, thank you. Can you please mute, mute your mic? Okay. Uh, okay, thank you very much. So once again, uh, uh, we have the chat. Do not hesitate to use the chat uh, to type your question, and if you have questions, we will, we will um, mention those questions to the speaker at the end of the presentation. So, okay, let's go. Caroline, once again, thank you very much for being here today, uh, and uh, we are listening to you. We cut our mic off. We put our microphone on. Well, thank you, Dominique, for that very flattering. Um, today, um, I, well, first, thank you all of you for attending this brown bag seminar. Um, I recognise some colleagues, um, some friends, and some people I don't know. So, some of you, many of you, will not have the background. Um, about the UN, so I'll, I'm going to play a very short recording of the evolution of the UN. Um, but I'm hoping that um, at the end of this presentation, in the next 30 minutes, uh, you will have understood the relevance of safe reporting channels for UN staff and for the, the vulnerable communities that the UN serve. You will evaluate the practice of whistleblower protection and how it works, and that hopefully at the end of it, you will understand the relevance of the whistleblower survivor narratives um, as a research framework that can inform and improve policy and hopefully improve the system. So without further ado, let me introduce you to um, the United Nations. Rachel Weiss, um, you may know, who starred in the film The Whistleblower, which is a story about Catherine Bolkovac, is narrating this. And she's explaining on the 70th anniversary of the UN how the UN got so, how it evolved so quickly, and how complex it is. So um, let me let you watch that. 1945. Fascism had been defeated, but at great human cost. Atomic weapons had been deployed for the first time, and a World War III was unthinkable. In San Francisco, 51 nations came together for what would become the first meeting of the United Nations, its ambition. 
to save future generations from the scourge of war and to reaffirm faith in human rights, to uphold international justice and to promote social progress. Pressure then. It began with a budget of just $20 million serving a global population of 2.3 billion people. Power would be held by the Allies who had won the Second World War, and they called the shots at the UN Security Council, the body which approves or vetoes the use of military force. Expansion was slow, as the Cold War enemies, the USA and the USSR, tried to prevent each other's allies from joining. But by the early 1960s, UN membership had doubled to 100 countries, and its agencies were multiplying. And while a new world war had been narrowly avoided, peace and prosperity was absent from much of the globe. As colonization ended in Africa, the continent struggled with famine, civil war, and apartheid. There was simmering war in the Middle East, and the great powers extended their conflict into space. Slowly, some important victories were achieved. By the 1970s, the UN's World Health Organization declared smallpox extinct. Peacekeeping and refugee operations were awarded Nobel Prizes. The rights of women across the world rose up the agenda, and the UN ranks well to 150 countries. By the 1990s, the Cold War was over, and the UN was catapulted into playing a bigger role in maintaining the new world order. Members signed up to tough promises regarding climate change in Kyoto. As the year 2000 approached, the UN agreed on the Millennium Development Goals. The new century brought new wars, and with them refugees and humanitarian crises. The Security Council was bypassed for American-led interventions in Afghanistan and Iraq, and natural disasters such as the Indian Ocean tsunami required multi-agency response. In 2015, the UN has 193 members. It oversees 16 separate peacekeeping missions. Its four main buildings occupy 18 acres of land and its 85,000 members of staff serve over 7 billion people. Each year it spends around $40 billion, more than 2,000 times its first budget in 1946. The challenges of this new century are vast. At 70 years old, is the United Nations able to adapt? And can it live up to its founding ideals? So there you have it, an overview of the uh, important work of the United Nations. Um, for those of you that have just joined, welcome. We just had an overview of the work of the uh, United Nations and how, uh, how much it's grown um, in the last um, 75 years now. So this is a, an overview of the UN system and congratulations to whoever was able to get all of this on one page. It really is a feat. But I've um, circled some of the really interesting uh, organisations which I'm talking about. I've got some of my own personal favourites, which are uh, the UNRWA operation in the Middle East, which takes care of the Palestinian refugees. Uh, there's the ILO, which is the old, one of the oldest organisations, which was set up after the First World War on the Treaty of Versailles and it has a, a, an excellent tripartite structure. You've got the WHO, which is, you may have heard, which is in the, has been the subject of uh, President Trump's wrath of late in the managing of COVID. Um, you have UNICEF, which is quite well known up there. And at the bottom, you see uh, the Department of Peacekeeping Operations, uh, which is uh, being the object of a lot of criticism. Uh, it is a flagship operation of the UN. It's done incredibly important work, but um, it's had a lot of questions posed by uh, the public on the management of its lives. I've also circled the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights because I'll be discussing a couple of cases in relation to the High Commission for Human Rights. And I've also circled right at the bottom the Office um, for Internal Oversight Services, because the question is, who, who keeps an eye on managing the oversight of this enormous organization? Um, so that OIOS at the bottom has a very, very important role. Uh, jumping 
to keeping operations here, just to correct the video we just heard, there are actually 14 UN peacekeeping operations um, around the world. And um, one of the issues for the UN is that it's not just staff that it monitors, that it controls, it has troop contributing countries. Um, uh, so just for your interest, we've got digressing slightly, the troops that core that contribute the most or the countries that contribute the most are Ethiopia, Rwanda, Bangladesh, India and Pakistan. You see the figures there. But the, 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 as we heard, the, the Security Council, who wields the most power, France, US, UK, China and Russia, you see that the contribution of the troops is relatively low. And of course, the wealthier nations have the have, have incredibly well-trained forces, but they are not deploying them to uh, peacekeeping missions. Um, and this is un unfair. It, this is an inequity, if you like. So I won't go into that in much detail, but one of the reasons that there are many issues uh, in peacekeeping is because the troops are afforded the same level of training. Um, so here's some of the statistics on um, uh, sexual exploitation and abuse um, allegations. Of the 40, these are 2017 statistics, two were substantiated, um, 15 are uh, reported from peacekeeping operations via the conduct and discipline um, database. Uh, 25 allegations are reported from agencies, funds and programs, uh, and 13 are categorised as sexual abuse. So, 54 victims in these 40 allegations and 30 are women, 16 girls, and um, under 18. So there have been efforts to optimise um, the investigations of these uh, incidents, but uh, the investigation capacity has been subject of much criticism. Are we, are we the, it's been understaffed? Yeah. And there have been reports that the investigations have not been as thorough as they could be. But um, one indicator is that uh, paternity claims have increased between 2013 and 2017. Um, so progress is being made to weed out um, and investigate these matters properly, it seems. But the question is, how do the reports get to the various offices that are responsible for investigating them. And in 1994, the Office of Internal Oversight Services was set up. Uh, it was later supplemented with the Ethics Office uh, in 2006, which was responsible for dealing with retaliation against whistleblowers or people that report misconduct. Now, one of the issues is that 10 years of operation of the UN Ethics Office, the results were a little disappointing. Um, I'm going to just play you the words here of James Wasserstrom, who was an, one of the earlier whistleblowers who worked in the peacekeeping operations in Kosovo. And James Wasserstrom identified corruption between kickbacks between UN officials and uh, a utility company, which he reported through channels. But he was stuck in litigation for seven or eight years um, to try to, you know, speak his truth. But this is uh, one of his observations, this is his observation about the ethics office. Yeah, these 300. I last saw it was 343. Uh, the UN ethics through, through 2012. <laughs> Those almost none had been validated as, as victims of retaliation. I think the rejection rate of whistleblowers' claims or protests. <laughs> Yes, 
sorry, I'm just getting a message that it was difficult to hear that. So what James Wasserstrom is saying is that he looked at his own complaint in the context of um, in the context of the system and he learned that I'll just go down to some of the statistics. This is the statistics of the of, of the UN whistleblower between 2006 and seven, and he was one of the individuals there listed in number 12, but there was no determination of retaliation after an investigation. So you see between 2006 and 2016, you have very few actual findings of retaliation. And one of the things that's important for a whistleblower is, is when I'm thinking about reporting this corruption, am I really going to be protected? I mean, and, and so I, I show you this, um, this little uh, picture here of the whistleblower here. And while there's protection and the policies in place, the whistleblower is not looking very comfortable because yes, you have to report and there is an obligation to report uh, under the UN staff rules. But am I going to be safe is, is the primary concern. Um, and this research stream um, that I'm very grateful to Webster for funding is looking at the narratives and the experiences of each of these whistleblowers so that we can learn more about how the system operates. Because one of the issues is it's not transparent. Um, the information that's given is confidential and that confidentiality has a place, but it puts us in difficulty when we're trying to understand, you know, how the decisions are made. So this is some of the things that a whistleblower will probably be thinking, you know, can I make a difference? Should I be the one to say something? I mean, who can I rely on to help? And um, this issue is not just germane to the United Nations. We have a new EU whistleblower directive, which is putting responsibility on all member states to ensure that there is whistleblower protection. But just because there's a policy there does not mean to say that it's happening or the protection's happening in practice. So what we need to do is probe the reasons for why that's happening. Um, and because it's shrouded in lack of transparency, it's very difficult. So as I say, between 2006 and 2016, there were um, many decisions that did not make a finding of retaliation. And people, that, what they, they were actually reviewed, four of them were reviewed by, um, by UN judges. Um, only four um, in a judicial review process. And my, I personally am a UN whistleblower and my case was reviewed. And under this uh, review that the, the United Nations Dispute Tribunal, and this lady here is an American judge, I've just used her image, um, found that there'd been 100% of error in ethics office decisions. So that, that was useful from the point of view that um, when you have independent um, analysis, there's the opportunity to learn. But the question is, um, what happened after the, the last decision in 2014 is that the UN decided, or well, the United Nations Appeal Tribunal, in Mr Wasserstrom's case, decided that no more cases should come before the tribunal. Um, and so there wasn't the opportunity to see if decisions had been taken correctly or not, if the discretion that's given to the ethics office um, was exercised properly. So these statistics, so, so what happened in 2007 to additionally complicate the system is that uh, ethics offices were set up in each of the individual funds and programs around the UN. And so instead of having one big umbrella uh, ethics office, there are all these little ethics offices, which actually report to the head of the agency. So one of the questions is, um, 
one of the questions is um can you know, what what do we what do we learn from this um oops Excuse me two, one second. My... Okay. So the heart of the issue is that there is a great deal of fear uh, of reporting, not just by staff members, but by, the, by those that are most vulnerable in the field um, that, the, that the United Nations serve. I today am an independent investigator um, and I go out with one mandate maybe, but I often find people come to me to talk to me about a certain issue that they are too frightened to report through the system because they don't trust it. So what, what are the barriers um, to this reporting? Um, you know, people genuinely, because of this delegation, of authority. There's lots of places to report to. You're your supervisor, you've got the ethics office, you've got um, the oversight body, but people really don't understand when you go to talk to them in the field, why, where they're supposed to report. It's, it's phenomenal. It's, um, it's just a fact. Um, uh, Fear of reprisal and repercussions. I mean, when you read some of these whistleblower narratives and you see the level at which uh, the level of reprisal, uh, not only from you know the people that are involved with the complaints, but from colleagues, um, it's 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 quite humbling because instead of addressing the issue, society perpetually looks at the issue of the West, the whistleblower and not the issue that they're trying to flag. And often, you know, the whistleblowers act as a utilitarian one. They're trying to be in service to the organization. It's not an individual one. So other concerns are the shame of it. Um, the fact that you, you might not have the overall picture um, of what's happening in the organization. You only have part of the picture. Um, not knowing how you will be protected is absolutely key because with the reporting from the ethics offices, we don't know what protection looks like, and people need that security before they speak up. Uh, it's not people think it's not important; it's too busy. Uh, there's the, a very real belief that you you won't get help, um, and then some people just don't want to get the person into trouble, which is you know which is understandable. But why why is whistleblowing important? It's because of all fraud and corruption in the whole UN system, the majority the, the whistleblowers bring to attention the majority of it, more than audit and investigation and inspection put together. And that was the finding of a, a JIU report, uh, the, the UN inspectors um, in 2016, I believe. Um, Just let me get the next slide here for you. So this is friend, yeah. Roosevelt, who was uh, instrumental um, in, in bringing the declaration um, of human rights to light. And uh, what we know about the UN itself is it's a very patriarchal organization it was um you know created by men um and eleanor roosevelt was one of the very very few women who um took part in setting it up and the culture in the organization is very patriarchal um so um, read a quote of hers uh, later, but I'm going to sh just share with you uh, the case of Anders Connors, which uh, got uh, quite a lot of attention and it was independently reviewed uh, by a judge. So this reportage is not one sided. It's it's been verified by an independent judge. 
resignation of Andes Compass is both a protest and criticism against the UN for how it handled one of the most shocking sex abuse scandals the world body has ever faced. Speaking to the Geneva-based Iron News Service, Compass attributed the lack of accountability from the UN as one of his reasons for leaving the agency after 17 years. He also blamed the unwillingness of UN officials to express regrets over how they treated him. Compass was earlier accused of breaching protocol and suspended from work last year for sharing a confidential UN report with French authorities, a report that detailed allegations of sexual abuse of children by French peacekeepers in the CAR between 2013 and 2014. Compass, who was field operations director at the UN's Human Rights Office, said he was frustrated by a lack of UN action to stop the abuse. An internal probe later cleared him, and an independent panel's investigation into the scandal found that peacekeepers deployed in the conflict zone had traded food or money with children as young as nine years old in exchange for sexual favors. Now, that panel also criticized the UN for gross institutional failure after finding that complaints had been passed from office to office within the UN system with no action taken, and that the UN had been more preoccupied with breach of protocols than addressing the allegations. The scandal had put several UN agencies under the spotlight, including UN Human Rights Agency, UNICEF, and the UN mission in the CAR known as MINUSCA all of which faced criticism over, over how they handled the sex abuse allegations. Under intense scrutiny, UN Chief Ban Ki-moon called for tough new measures to deal with crimes committed by those tasked to protect. But that has done little to stem the continued reports of peacekeeper sex abuse that have emerged since, many of them involving children. Healing Tan, CCTV, New York. So thank you, Li Ling. You've explained that far more eloquently than I could. Um, and just the next case I'm bringing to your attention is a very controversial one, which is before the judge um, as we speak. It's the case of Emma Riley, also from the Human Rights um, Organization. And she reported uh, in 2016, she was one of the last cases considered under the old policy. Um, she reported that um, her supervisor had accepted gifts um, from a member state government and that the identity of Chinese dissidents had been disclosed to the Chinese government. And the UN position on that is that this absolutely did not take place. Um, so Emma Riley um, was one of the last cases considered by the old ethics office and it was carried over into a new into a, the new whistleblower policy which was introduced in 2017 at the behest of the un secretary general antonio guterres um, who faced a very uh, angry mob of staff when he arrived for his first staff meeting in geneva because one of the very first things staff wanted to know was what has we've had 10 years of unsatisfactory protection of whistleblowers what are you going to do about it and uh he said i'm going to set up a new policy and so we have some figures um from the new policy and they are certainly improved but um if we could get more information about what's happening i think it would encourage maybe a new generation of people to speak up but what has happened in Emma's case is, is that she's filed three cases with the UN tribunal and she won her first case. But the second case, um, the judge considered and for whatever reason, the secretary general decided to remove the judge and uh, to uh, put a new judge to consider the case. And that is, was happening last week, as I understand. So when we get the outcome of the Riley case, we'll have more insights into um, how the ethics office acted in her case but the initial information that came from the first case was uh, not encouraging shall we say so i see that i'm coming to the end of uh, my time because i said to before i can take some questions so 
This is a, a map of, of, of where, I mean, an overview of where we really need to go is that, you know, at the outer circle, there really is a, the, a failure to report. The tip of the iceberg are the people that do report. So for all of those figures that we saw in those charts, there is a, a massive number of individuals who are still too frightened to report. And that is because of the fear of reprisal. And the whistleblower narratives indicate, and we saw what happened to Anders Kampus. I mean, Anders Kampus was a senior Swedish diplomat protected by his government who made, uh, who got an independent hearing. Um, but we have to, the UN responsibility to give protection and relief in, in host communities, vulnerable people cannot, uh, really, really do fear reprisal. I spend a lot of my investigation time um, going out into uh, Africa and Asia um, to speak with uh, vulnerable communities about uh, various allegations. And they, they, you know, they are by and large petrified to speak up because they don't know where to go and they don't know who to trust in essence. So we have a uh, whistleblower protection failure in the organization. Um, and it is uh, at the core of it all is, is the culture of denial, um, which is not, a, not being open to the fact that every single organization struggles with this issue. Um, the EU initiative, the EU legislation is bringing to light how governments are struggling, how businesses are struggling but if you continue to litigate against individuals who voiced concerns in the in the interest of the organization that also does not inspire confidence i myself was litigated against for 15 years um which was a rather unpleasant experience um, and although um i was vindicated at the end and given an apology it was did not set a good example to uh, create a speak up culture in the organization. So um, this research finally um, will hopefully serve to inform the non-transparent practices of implementation of protection. Um, we have to remember whistleblower protection is a collective issue, or it's a collective responsibility. It's not an individual one. It's about utilitarian action in service to the public good. An interesting point is that, you know, why we as a society are so concerned about the whistleblower themselves and less concerned about the issue that's reported. That is something that I, I ponder myself. And it's what we, uh, we, we always have to keep getting back to the issue itself. Um, protection policies uh, are not a substitute for a safe retaliation free workplace at all. Uh, we've got to keep working on that. And the EU um, whistleblower directive mandating protection um, provides us with a platform for learning, which, which the UN can learn from um, as well. And just finally, um, with all the um, events in, um, in America, I was thinking about Martin Luther King and his timeless, wonderful wisdom and quotes, um, that justice and freedom is, is never voluntarily given by the oppressor. It must be demanded by the oppressed. And I'm really hoping that these narratives, um, when they come to light, will be in service to the institution to see how it can continue to learn and to improve. And so without further ado, I think I just went over my time, Dominique, um, and maybe we can move to some questions and dialogue about this issue. Well done, perfect. Thank you very much, Caroline. Thank you very much. I mean, it was a, a fascinating presentation on a very interesting topic. So. Very much for, for sharing. Thank you very much for, for sharing uh, your knowledge about this uh, fascinating topic. Uh, and thank you very much for sticking to the time. Okay, so it means that we have enough space for questions. Okay, so if anyone would like to start, I mean, you are very welcome. Please uh, open your mic and uh, we will be listening to you, to your question. I have a question for Caroline. 
thank you. Yeah, please. Thank you. So, Caroline, thank you so much for that um, expose. It was very well done, very succinct. And as you and I both know, we've had, you know, I served for 18 years and also had a long experience with the internal system of justice or lack thereof. But um, I was just wondering if we were to consider, you know, case precedents and as you detailed, you know, the development, shall we say, of the internal system of justice, OIOS, the ethics office, what is what is the solution to what the real problem is, which is a lack of political will for protection and for a discouraging retaliation when the organization, like a lot of hierarchical organizations, militaries and governments, wish to keep their staff in line? Um, is it what, what do you think the solution is? Um, it's certainly not adding another structure, probably. You know, to the ethics and the organization, the office of internal oversight. So I was just curious, given your own intimate exposure to the system and this and these issues and my own, like, what would, what do you think the solution is to the real problem? Well, I think ultimately we're looking at. We we we, we lost your your. Can you put your camera back, Caroline? Uh, uh, it, 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 um, you remove the camera, so it would be nice. yeah. <laughs> okay. So thank you for that question, Sally. Um, I think that reflecting on the narratives, you, we're looking at the the and um, and consulting with other academics um, on this issue. Um, that we're looking at a lot of the way that power is used, and of course, the United Nations was set up by the power holders, the winners of the war that held the power. It made the rules. Um, the rules are not fair across the organizations. Obviously, the winners, you know, got to take, um, you know, the best parts like the Security Council. The staff rules aren't fair and the internal justice system is not fair. Um, it wasn't designed that way. So we've got these dis structural discrepancies um, that, you know, the whistleblower has to go through the system. There's been yet another review of the internal justice system. The, Government Accountability Project just put in uh, a whole list of uh, suggestions as to what can be done to try and get some equity into this power disparity. But um, you know, quite frankly, it's a, it's structurally the power differential is so big between the power holder and the whistleblower. It's um, you know, it's a no-win situation. I think, quite frankly. But the more transparency we have about these experiences, the more that we can bring these experiences to light, the more we can maybe attempt to improve the system. But yeah, it's pretty grim, I think. <laughs> As you know, I mean, I you know, your case is is one that I've written about. And uh, for those of you that are present, it's Sally um, was somebody that blew the whistle, which sorry, supported somebody that that blew the whistle and because she supported she was directly supervised by the person she supported she was retaliated against as a gender advisor and her a case Sally's case was settled out of court and it was one that never came to light so there are many many cases of whistleblowers that don't 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 get as far as some of those that I've mentioned today and yours is one such, Sally. But thank you for your contribution um, to to for what you did and for how you protected that um, you know the complainant. Uh, that that was um, you know that's the work of the true loyal UN staff, of which there are many. Thank you, thank you Caroline. Thank you. Thank you, Caroline. Thank you. Any other question from uh, the audience? Yes, uh, good afternoon. My name is Bea Schuller. I work uh, at the Ethics Office UNHCR. Thank you very much for your presentation. And it's very interesting to, to hear the past. I would be interested also to hear what's the analysis of the new uh, tools uh, the organizations the UN does have since the Secretary General's bulletin of 2017 came up with a revision of the whistleblower policy, the protection against retaliation, 
UNHCR followed then in 2018 and came also up with a new administrative instruction on protection against retaliation. What are your observations of these tools? Um, how do you consider them as an improvement of the system? Are the issues which you have mentioned and you have mentioned, are they addressed? Thank you very much. Well, thank you for that question. I mean, I think it's it's an excellent one. Um, you know, I know the system, I mean, I mean, Secretary General Guterres said, I am going to make this better uh, and, and introduce the policy. But in fairness, there was nothing wrong with the old policy. There was just a, a lack of political will and I think a lack of experience in dealing with these with these retaliation complaints. Now, one of the things that's interesting, you said you were from UNHCR and you might have seen in my presentation the JIU um, reviewed all the cases that have been reported to um, UNHCR and that in 2018 there were zero findings of retaliation. Is that correct? It's before my days and times, uh, but I uh, probably, yes, uh, that's, that's correct, yes. Yes, so, so when the when the whistleblower in UNHCR is thinking about reporting and they see all of those complaints that were filed and there was a zero finding of retaliation, plus you have some history in that organisation with the problems with your Inspector General's office, um, which I was you know, personally involved in, um, I think that it doesn't inspire confidence and you're in a very difficult uh, role there, my friend, because you have inherited a legacy of persecution of people that speak up and to try to change that culture is going to be very, very difficult. Um, but I am the eternal optimist and I'm sure that you will find a way. But when we've created this legacy of a, a decade or 12 years of not supporting whistleblowers, it's difficult to overcome. But um, onwards and upwards, we've just got to work towards it together, I think. Vis a vis your question on analysis, by the way, I think for the system generally, the, the, the statistics are looking more positive, but I think UNHCR at zero is not, not looking good. Any other question? Uh, hi. Um, my name is Ruth. I don't work for the UN system, I work for the ICC. So my question may come off as incredibly naive, I'm, I'm sure, but uh, I will give it a shot anyway. Um, to what extent do you think that encouraging um, active bystanding methods and providing trainings to people to try to change this culture in this sort of gradual and, so let's say, organic way would work um, in, in the UN or, or in specialized agencies or whether in secretariat. So do you think that if taken, let's say, maybe on some sort of, uh, let's say, a small basis and growing it slowly, that that would have some sort of impact on changing the culture in the longer term? This is not a legal question. This is just in terms of literally talking about culture. Okay, sorry, I didn't catch your first name. It's a Ruth Frolik. Ruth. Yes. Ruth, thank you. thank you for that question. I think it's a very important one uh, and a thoughtful one coming from the ICC. Um, and I think training is critical, uh, but it's not. It's part of. It's part of a bigger solution. Um, and as I say, uh, people will always look to how people have been treated before. Um, and you know, for example, I get calls from you know, whistleblowers that are thinking about blowing the whistle and, you know, would would I advise them to do it or would I just, I can't make that decision for you. Um, you know, you have to inform yourself, you have to do your own research. And I think, you know, people are painfully aware, uh, especially with the increase in training now, that yes, you are supposed to report this, but they, they just don't want the responsibility to 
you know, invoke retaliation, which is still very much alive and well. Um, it, you know, uh, even, you know, post-employment, people are blacklisted, um, you know, for speaking up. Um, I see this not just in the UN. I work with international NGOs now, and I see, you know, I see the same patterns. And it's something, I think it's to do with the, the humanitarian context is, is quite a patriarchal culture. And this, you know, this is what happens, you know, people get their, um, you know, reputations ruined. So um, until we actually get better at proper investigation of retaliation complaints, and uh, because there's been a lot of, it, it's very, very difficult to investigate retaliation. As you know, it's circumstantial evidence that you have to take into account. And until we get to have some independent review probably of all of those cases and they're not many between 2006 and 2016 every single case should be reviewed because when you've got four cases which a judge found there were 100 percent error in these cases well i'm sorry we need to look at them all again and i think if if there was some sort of truth commission which is there's been a, a request the government accountability uh, projects have, have asked for an independent um review of all of these cases um as as uh, you may have seen what's happened with UNAIDS and with uh unicef there's been an internal review of how people have been treated and that's you know good good for those organizations for being courageous enough to open themselves up to that and hopefully unhr will do it one day <laughs> but thank you for that question does it answer your question Yes, of course, to some degree, I think that we are all, I think I'm certainly I'm aware that it, it's always part of a bigger puzzle. Everything, there are a lot of, I think, different pieces that have to fit together for the whole system to work well. And I, I there are political barriers, there are structural barriers, there are, and there are cultural barriers. And I, and I think that I, I was just trying to gauge to what extent you might think it's helpful. I, I found in my work um, that, um, that is often a very key it's a key factor often but of course i work for a very different institution and it's a much smaller institution looking at it it's looking at the un globally right so it's it's a very different environment and this is why i was i was trying to get your impression on that point so thank you very much for that yeah i don't know if you have anything to share with this group about your experience that would be very interesting to see what's happening at the icc do you have anything to share ruth <laughs> There's plenty to share. I'm not sure if this would be necessarily the appropriate forum for that. Uh, but um, no, I, I work. I'm, I'm president of the staff union at the ICC, and uh, so we assist staff members in, in employment-related issues. And then I, I work with staff directly together with my other colleagues, and, and we have had active outstanding trainings done at the court, which we organized, and, and we have seen that ha that has had a very positive impact on staff. Um, this is exactly why I'm bringing it up here. And obviously, active bystanding is not something that we've come up with. This is, this is an old concept. Um, it does work in some contexts, but of course, you have to have other things in place. We have to have solid policies, as you said. You have to have a great independent body investigating. You have to have a structural fairness, all these pieces. And of course, politics may play a role. I think maybe in our case, they play a smaller role than in, than in yours. I'm happy to exchange separately on some specific questions. Thank you so. very much, Ruth, yeah. at the ICC. Thanks. Excellent, good. Uh, thank you very much. I mean, we still have some time for one or two questions, so not hesitate if you want to do it, do it now. Uh, alternatively, I will ask um, Celia, Celia, do you have some question on the chat? No, we don't have any questions on the chat. We just have quite a few messages saying congratulations, Caroline. It was a great presentation. So there's got a few messages like this, but no questions on the chat for now. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So do we still have questions or is it the end of this presentation? So thank you, thank you for all. Thank you very much uh, to 
speaker. Uh, it was, I insist, but I think it was a fantastic presentation on a very stimulating approach. So thank you very much. It was nice to, to hear you. And, uh, and thank you to, to, to all these, the person who attended uh, to this presentation. Thank you for your participation. We are very happy that you have been able to join the uh, University Geneva for, for this event. Uh, I'm sorry, Dominique. I'm really sorry to interrupt. Actually, there is someone who has a question who just manifested himself. Uh, good. Yes. So um, the name is Anton. The question hasn't come yet, but he's asking for attention and I'm assuming typing. Okay. We, we, it's coming. Sorry, I interrupted, but yeah. Good. good. We, we have time. We have time. While we're waiting, Dominic, I just want to say thank you to Webster for supporting this research because you see how important these narratives are to helping everybody to understand um, how these decisions are made and how the process can be improved. So um, thank you for that. And hopefully we'll get a positive decision and the book will be out next year. Uh, yeah, <laughs> we wish. <laughs> Good. <laughs> So, our last question. Yeah, can I have a question? This is Serena. You probably remember me. Oh, hello, Serena. Hello, everybody. I love Webster. <laughs> uh, just, uh, just a sh really sh small, short question. Um, you had the courage to report that. Um, are there other places in other international organizations which you are aware of about these things? Uh, uh, just let me just repeat to make sure I understand, Serena. Am I aware of other individuals in other organizations who have reported or who have not reported? Who have reported on this kind of things of uh, whistleblowers cases? It's not you personal. Just uh, I, I'm I'm saying um, in the in other big organization because I'm sure this happens in if it happens in big organization for sure it happens in small organizations. Oh yes, I mean you know it's it's. It's everywhere. Um, I speak to a lot of people who are thinking about blowing the whistle, or, um, about about how they'll be protected. Um, so it's um, you know, it, and it's a personal decision. You can never take that. I would never advise anybody to one way or the other. I can just inform them of my experience and the experience of others. But yes, I speak to many whistleblowers that are thinking about blowing the whistle and those that have, that regret it. Um, it's, it's part of my research. Um, and I'm always learning, uh, always, always learning. Uh, it's, it's, um, it's endemic to the human condition. I mean, we, most of these um, issues, they come from mistakes and then people hide the mistake <laughs> and then it gets bigger and bigger. I'm sure at one point, oil for food was just a little dot, you know, on the landscape. But um, yes, I mean, it just grew into something enormous. And people, you know, people knew about things beforehand. You know, especially in in um, you know an organisation, it's like a family. So people know what's going on. So yes, in answer to your question, Selena, it's it's everywhere. Yeah. So Sorry, I didn't quite, could you just repeat that? I didn't quite hear. So I was thinking like the same as we did it in, we, I didn't do it because I was not yet born at that time. In 1950, the, the, it started the, the movement against racism. Maybe we should start a movement against this as a, be, being a sort of humanity practice to protect the, the right to speak. That's a very beautiful. That's a very beautiful thought. And actually, you know, Article 19 of the Universal Declaration for Human Rights is that right to express your truth. 
and uh, you know whistleblowers are human rights defenders at the bottom you know of the line and there's a wonderful I mean the highlights of, of whistleblowing is meeting the rest of the whistleblower community they are amazing souls and we do get together periodically for conferences discuss how to do things better but what whistleblowers really need is the support of the community at wide is that they really need people to understand their issue and to be heard so i think that's a very beautiful thought serena and if you've got insights on how we can get that started i'll be in touch with you after the talk Good, good, excellent. Sylvia, Sylvia, you have a challenge. I mean, you, you've got five or six questions. You have to select. Uh, Caroline, you have another challenge is to give the answer in two minutes. Uh, what's the question? Okay, so the question is from Eva Dim. The question is, in terms of cultural change in an era of social media, how can these digital tools be used to promote a more supportive okay. and upsetting uh, positive environment when the topic is so sens sensitive and often personal? What a brilliant question. Well, being a total technological null with all social media, I'm not even on it. I'm not really the best person to advise that. But um, my, my children are great informants and I, I listen to them on this topic. Um, and I think that, you know, I would just encourage people in this world that we live in where finding the truth, I mean, genuinely fact finding is the first stage to, to everything. So, you know, I would do your own, do your own research. It's great practice. Find out what's truth and what's fiction. And, you know, use social media to pose questions. You don't have to have an opinion, but asking great questions is a really, really important role on social media. You know, how do we hold um, how do we hold these massive institutions to account? I mean, uh, one of my personal heroes is uh, Yasmin Morta Jamie, who was the food safety um, chief at Nestle, and she flagged Nestle's practices for not doing the right thing at the right time um, to save lives, and was fired. She's taken one woman taken on Nestle. Um, she won her case this year, fantastic, but Nestle have appealed. Now, you know, I'm, if I'm buying Nestle food, you know, it's like, why are you appealing against somebody that is doing their job? You know, but I just, the bottom line is I would encourage you to find the facts. And if you don't know the facts, ask the question. And yes, I think social media is wonderful. And then one of these days I will get up to speed. So thank you for that question, Eva. Thank you, Caroline. You did very well also for the question. So thank you very much. I see it's two o'clock. So unfortunately, we have to, to stop now. Thanks again. We, we have recorded the session. So we will put a link uh, to allow you to gain access to this recording. We put the link on uh, the news section of our website. So Webster University Geneva News. We will put uh, the link about this, uh, this presentation. Thank you to all, and especially thank you to our wonderful speaker. Good. Have a nice thank afternoon. You. Goodbye, all. Thank you very much for listening. It was a great pleasure to speak to you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. I'm so disappointed I'm tuning in from, from the U.S. and I had the time zone wrong. Okay, wow. <laughs> so you wake uh, up early. Yeah? Did you wake up? I, I was up an hour ago too, but I I thought it was seven hours and I guess it was it was not seven hour time change. Caroline okay, had said, Caroline had said it was at one o'clock. Ah, okay. Uh, one o'clock, yeah, it was one o'clock in Geneva, Geneva time. So I what know, time but I guess we're eight hours different now and so we're we must be okay. I, I calculated the time wrong, but I will watch the lecture. Okay. Okay. We will share the recording. Thank you very much for joining us. Bye. Bye. Out of your meeting.